Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Shrine of the Most Holy Redeemer in Las Vegas, Nevada. We thank you for joining us this morning for this very special liturgy, the ordination to the Order of Bishops of Most Reverend Gregory W. Gordon. Our opening hymns this morning are all people that on earth do dwell, as well as I walk onto the altar of God. Please rise.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. This is a jubilee day in the Diocese of Las Vegas, a time for rejoicing, a time to give thanks to Almighty God for this singular blessing we have received as our brother, your son, Gregory, is being called the Episcopal Order. Today, as we begin this liturgy, a number of important introductions are in order. Thank you, Cardinal Roger Mahoney, for gracing our day and being to me such a steady friend since my own ordination in 2000, where you were in Seattle and then in Helena and now here in Las Vegas for a second time. You're a blessing to me and for this whole group of people gathered in the name of the Lord. We are also... We are blessed by the presence of His Excellency Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio of the United States, the personal representative of our beloved Holy Father. Archbishop's second visit to the diocese is today, and by his presence, we're connected not only to the Universal Church, but also to the See of Peter. The Archbishop has been appointed in 2016 to the United States, but has served in Mexico nine years, in Uganda, in Haiti, a seasoned, loving, visionary leader. Please give a warm Las Vegas welcome to His Excellency, Archbishop Pierre. Also in the sanctuary are two distinguished archbishops, Archbishop Salvador Cordeleone, the Metropolitan Archbishop of San Francisco, under which we are a suffragan diocese, along with His Excellency Archbishop Jose Gomez, Archbishop of Los Angeles, and the President of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. To both of you, we feel so very blessed by your presence, and I know our brother Greg feels particularly honored that you would take the time out of your very busy schedules to be with us on this ordination day. A very warm welcome. Last year, our diocese celebrated its Silver Jubilee, marking 25 years as the diocese. And today, the Jubilee is marked by a capstone, the presence of the first bishop of Las Vegas, Bishop Daniel Walsh, and the second bishop, Joseph Pepe, both of whom will serve as co-consecrators for Bishop Gorman. What a wonderful way to celebrate a Jubilee, and thank you. In the bishop-elect's name, I want to express particular thanks to the 18 brother bishops who were present on his ordination day to welcome him into the College of Bishops as the newest member of the American hierarchy. What an honor to have so many bishops here and a warm welcome to all of you. I acknowledge the presence as well of the Las Vegas Presbyterate our consultors, along with visiting priests from across the country. Our priests in this diocese are so grateful to the Holy Father that he has chosen one of our own to serve as an auxiliary bishop in this local church. I rejoice with our brother priests, and thank you. <laughs> to the deacons and religious, to so many who are serving in parishes and our institutions, carrying out hidden works of mercy. To the knights and dames of our, the equestrian order, of the Holy Sepulchre, the knights of Columbus, the knights and ladies of Peter Claver, the Catholic laity from all across this 34,000 square mile diocese, to the ecumenical leaders, civic leaders, and in a very special way, to Greg's family. Mother is here. You have made this possible, Mrs. Gordon. And <laughs> Many of the Gordon extended family have come all the way from Pennsylvania to be with us. Special blessings to your late husband, Bill, of course, is here in spirit. We come together as God's family on this holy day. Let us now humbly acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. 
I confess to Almighty God and to you and my brothers and sisters that, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in my words and what, in I, what have I have done, done and what I have done and failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most graceful fault. Therefore, I ask this all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, that I have been May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. eternal shepherd, who governing your flock with watchful care, choose to join Gregory, your servant and priest, to the College of Bishops this day. Grant, we pray, that by his holiness of life, he may everywhere prove to be a true witness to Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, thus, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Ah, Lord God, I said, I know not how to speak, I am too young. But the Lord answered me, say not, I am too young. To whomever I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. 
Have no fear before them, because I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord extended his hand and touched my mouth, saying, See, I place my words in your mouth. The word of the Lord. Lectura de la Carta de los Hebreos Hermanos, todo sumo sacerdote escogido entre los hombres está puesto para representar a los hombres en el culto de Dios, para ofrecer dones y sacrificios por los pecados. Él puede comprender a los ignorantes y extraviados, ya que él mismo está envuelto en debilidades. A causa de ella, tiene que ofrecer sacrificios por sus propios pecados, como por los del pueblo. Nadie puede arrogarse este honor. Dios es quien llama, como en el caso de Aarón. Tampoco Cristo se confirió a sí mismo la dignidad de sumo sacerdote, sino aquel que le dijo, «Tú eres mi hijo, yo te he engendrado hoy». O como dice otro pasaje de la Escritura, «Tú eres sacerdote eterno, según el rito de Melquisedec». Cristo, en los días de su vida mortal, a gritos y con lágrimas, presentó oraciones y súplicas al que podía salvarlo de la muerte, cuando en su angustia fue escuchado. Él, a pesar de ser hijo, aprendió sufriendo a obedecer, y llevado a la consumación, se ha convertido para todos los que le obedecen el autor de salvación eterna. 
proclamada por Dios sumo sacerdote, según el rito de Melquisedec. Palabra de Dios. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A higher man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have another sheep that I do not belong to this fold. This also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and they will be one flock, One shepherd. En aquel tiempo dijo Jesús, yo soy el buen pastor. El buen pastor da la vida por las ovejas. El asalariado, el asalariado que no es pastor ni dueño de las ovejas, ve venir al lobo, abandona las ovejas y huye. Y el lobo hace estrago y las dispersa. Y es que un asalariado no le importan las ovejas. Yo soy el buen pastor, que conozco a las mías, y las mías me conocen, igual que el Padre me conoce, y yo conozco al Padre. Yo doy mi vida por las ovejas. Tengo además otras ovejas que no son de este redil. También a esas las tengo que traer. Y escucharán mi voz, y habrá un solo rebaño y un solo pastor. Palabra del Señor. Thank you. 
Most Reverend Father, the Holy Catholic Church, our mother, asks you to ordain this priest, Gregory William Gordon, to the office of bishop. Reverendissimo Padre, la Santa Iglesia Católica, nuestra madre, pide que ordenes a este presbítero, Gregory William Gordon, al oficio de obispo. Have you a mandate from the Apostolic See? We have. Lo tenemos. Let it be read. Your Eminence, Cardinal Rogelio Roge Mahoni, Your Excellency Metropolitan Archbishop Salvatore Cordileone, this is an Italian name, isn't it? <laughs> Especialmente Cordileone. No? Your Excellency Archbishop Jose Gomez, Archbishop of Los Angeles, this is an Mexican name. Right? <laughs> Bishop Josh Thomas. Your Excellency Bishop Emeritus Joseph Pepe, another Italian name. <laughs> My God. <laughs> but finally, Your Excellency Daniel Walsh. No mistake. <laughs> Your Excellency Auxiliary Bishop Elect Gordon. My brother as bishops and bishops. Dear priests, deacons, consecrated religious and lay faithful of the Diocese of Las Vegas, dear friends, I, as I have the honor to represent the Pope for Francis in this country. I'm truly pleased to be with you as uh, Reverend Monsignor Gregory Gordon is ordained to the fullness of the priesthood and begins his ministry as the first Auxiliary Bishop of Las Vegas and close collaborator to Bishop Thomas. Monsignor Gordon has distinguished himself not only as Vicar General and until recently as Pastor of St. Anne Church, but also through his dedication to the Holy See through his service at the Nunciature under my predecessors. In the Chancery of the Nunciature, we have a big gallery of all the collaborators of the Nunciature, there are many. And uh, for the last five years, I've watched your photo. Now I'm happy to see you face to face. <laughs> Jesus himself was driven into the desert before he began his public ministry in the spirit. Your Excellency Bishop Elect Gordon, as you begin your Episcopal, Episcopal ministry in Las Vegas, which is experiencing rapid growth in its Catholic population, your zeal for your mission and for pastoral ministry must be guided by the Spirit so that you may overcome to the many challenges to evangelization. One way of overcoming these challenges is by getting to know your flock personally as you begin your mission, I place before you the words of the Holy Father, which he spoke a few years ago to those to be consecrated as bishops. I quote, in the church entrusted to you, be faithful custodians and dispensers of the mysteries of Christ. As the Father has placed you at the head of his family, always follow the example of the Good Shepherd, who knows his sheep. Behind every document, there is a person. Behind every letter that you receive, there is a person. May these people be known to you, and may you be capable of knowing them. Do you understand that? <laughs> Today is the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Under the, her protection and by her intercession, may you come to know the true needs of the flock and open others to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, helping them to know the love of Christ, the Good Shepherd, and His Immaculate Mother, 
Finally, may the guardian angels also watch over you and the people of the Diocese of Las Vegas as you assist Bishop Thomas in his ministry. At this time, it is with great pleasure that I read for you the apostolic letter of appointment. This letter will be given to, to you. As you know, it is signed by Pope Francis, and you, are, you will be all invited to check that it is a true letter, you know. <laughs> Francis, bishop, servant of the servants of God, to our beloved son, Gregory William Gordon, from the clergy of the Diocese of Las Vegas, and until now, Chancellor and Moderator of the Curia, as well as Vicar General there, appointed auxiliary of the same ecclesial community, and at the same time, promoted to the titular see of Nova Pietra. Greetings and apostolic blessing. Upon reception of Episcopal ordination, those who are sent by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel, go forth, just as saints Peter and Paul admonish us to proclaim the mystery of God, not with the sublimity of words of wisdom, but rather to speak to all about the goodness of God, who was pleased to reveal himself in Jesus Christ and him crucified leaving us in the way an example that we should follow in its footsteps with fervent charity. Accordingly, when our venerable brother, George Leo Thomas, Bishop of Las Vegas, not long ago requested an auxiliary bishop owing to pastoral needs, we gladly granted his petition. And so, it is our judgment that you, beloved son, should be chosen to carry out this responsibility, given that you are clearly endowed with prudence, spiritual life, practical experience, and sound learning. Therefore, upon consultation with the Congregation for Bishops, from the fullness of our apostolic authority, we name you titular Bishop of Nova Pietra, and likewise appoint you auxiliary of the Diocese of Las Vegas, conferring upon you the due rights and imposing the relative obligations in accordance with the norms of the Code of Canon Law. You may receive Episcopal ordination from a Catholic bishop anywhere outside the city of Rome, the liturgical norms being observed. However, prior to this, you must make the profession of faith and take the oath of fidelity toward us and our successors in this sea. Finally, beloved son, we entrust you and your ministry to the protection of the most blessed Virgin Mary and that of Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse, so that in nourishing the souls of Christ's faithful and in looking after both their sanctification as well as your own, you may never be lacking in anything given at Rome, at the Lateran, on the 28th day of the month of May, in the year of the Lord, 2021, the ninth of our pontificate. And it is signed, Francis.
Dear friends, it was in the year 325. 200 bishops convened in the ancient city of Nicaea, the first ecumenical council in the history of our church. The bishops traveled in the summer heat of present-day Turkey. They had a grave and urgent purpose in mind. They were there to address and to suppress the most persistent and divisive heresy in the history of the church. The driving force behind the crisis was a gifted priest, charismatic, skilled at teaching, hailing from the city of Alexandria in Egypt. His influence had spread well beyond North Africa and into the churches scattered throughout Asia Minor. Arius used his highly honed skills as teacher and preacher to question and ultimately to deny the divine nature of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Of course, this being the very heart of the church's identity and the soul of Jesus' mission. The fathers of that first council managed to mitigate but not excise the heresy, which had spread like a cancer through the body of the church. And even after Arius was removed from office and exiled, the Arian heresy remained present and active in the church covertly for the remainder of the fourth century. Therefore, in the year 381, the fathers convened again, this time in Constantinople. And they gathered to face down this tenacious heresy and to address new conflicts disturbing the life of the church. Those two councils, taken together, inspired what has come to be known as the Great Nicene Creed, a creed conceived in the crucible of crisis and controversy. This, my friends, is the creed we have proclaimed every Sunday and solemnity for the past 1,000 years. The Nicene Creed is proclaimed each week because it is an anchor when the church is tossed about on the rough waters of discord. It has served as a litmus test each time the church encounters new and dangerous forms of heterodoxy. It has been the common ground for years of ecumenical dialogue. It has been a compass and a sextant on the open seas of trouble, always directing the church back to the teachings of the apostles and refocusing her eyes on the morning star that never sets. In the words of St. Ambrose, the Nicene Creed is the ever-present guardian inspired by the Spirit and tested in the cauldron of crisis. The creed is the church's constant reminder to you and me that ours is a Trinitarian faith and that everything we are and do is done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This creed gives us that blessed assurance that the Spirit of God is present and active in good times and in bad, in days of calm and in nights of crisis, now and until the end of time. Bishop-elect Gordon, embedded in the Nicene Creed, this iconic prayer, are the four marks of the church, marks that describe her as one holy Catholic and apostolic, words that capture her deepest 
an ultimate identity. And I propose to you, in your new life as a bishop, that these four marks can serve you well as you find your footing and gain your equilibrium. Four marks that have the potential to help define the contours of your ministry as our new auxiliary bishop and the newest member of the American hierarchy. One holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The first mark of the church is that the church is one. The fathers of the Second Vatican Council declared that each diocesan bishop is to be the visible source and foundation of unity in his own diocese, always, of course, in communion with the See of Peter. You will be asked to assist me in the mission of unity. The first mark echoes the preaching of Paul. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and works through all and is in all. But also as the bishop is the guardian of unity, he is also the guarantor of lawful diversity, taking great pains to ensure that the local church embodies and embraces the full spectrum of languages and customs and colors and textures that make up the rich and varied fabric of the church. When reflecting on the unity of the church, Pope Francis offers an important caveat to all bishops. It is the spirit, he wrote, who brings forth a unity which is never uniformity, but a multifaceted and inviting harmony. In the diversity of peoples, the church expresses her genuine Catholicity and shows forth the beauty of her varied face. Gregory, you know already from your years of experience in the field that the unity of the church can also be disturbed, disturbed by afflictions and hardships which, in the words of the council, assail her from within and without and therefore the church must always pursue the path of penance and renewal. As new crises emerge and new conflicts appear, and they will as surely as night follows day, I ask you to pay close heed to the wise counsel of Thomas Aquinas and attend to the admonitions and example of our Holy Father, Pope Francis. In a word, when addressing and reconciling conflict and division, prefer invitation over invective, dialogue over diatribe, persuasion above polemic, cohesion over coercion. This will help, in the words of Isaiah, to avoid quenching quenching the smoldering wick, or breaking the bruised reed. Learn to recognize early on the perils that ensue if a bishop attempts to exercise leadership by popularity, or governance by appeasement or partisanship. These approaches will ultimately compromise your credibility and destabilize the church's theological foundations. And if prescriptive measures or canonical sanctions do become necessary for the good of the church, remember, they are there as servants of the common good, medicines to heal a wounded church, measures for restoring holy order, all to be exercised with moderation and restraint. And finally, under the heading of unity, remember this. As storm clouds of controversy gather overhead, take consolation in the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. The Council Fathers wrote, the bonds which unite the faithful are mightier 
than anything which divides them. Hence, let there be unity in what is necessary, freedom in what is unsettled, and charity in any case. The second mark of the church is holiness. Holiness is the common and universal call shared by laity, religious, and clergy alike. After he quoted from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Pope Francis added this poignant commentary. The Lord has chosen, to be, chosen us to be holy and blameless in his sight. He wants us to be saints and not to settle for a bland and mediocre existence. In your Episcopal ministry, Greg, continue to foster an active life of prayer and carry out hidden works of charity unimpeded by the dissipating demands of Episcopal ministry. Help me to ensure that the celebration of the Eucharist always remains central to the life of this diocese, but also remains the heartbeat of your spiritual life as an auxiliary bishop. Above all else, as you encounter Jesus personally in your life, help others to encounter him too, deeply, intimately, personally, and daily in the particular circumstances of their lives. That second mark of holiness begins in and through charismatic and charismatic proclamation of Jesus' love, redeeming love for every person, no exception. The third mark of the church is Catholic, a term first used by Ignatius of Antioch in the first century as he described the universal mission of the church. As you envision this third mark, I want you to call to mind the image of the Bernini colonnades welcoming the people into St. Peter's Square. They are designed to evoke the image of a church holding out her arms to the world in warm and maternal embrace. The word Catholic expresses the church's solidarity with all of humanity and most especially with the lives of the poor, with those who are afflicted, and with those who have never even heard the holy name of Jesus. How often Pope Francis has admonished church leaders to ever be on guard against ecclesial interversion, lest the church become self-enclosed or self-referential. Rather, the church is intended to be outward-looking, preaching the gospel far and wide, and dispensing the medicine of mercy with generous and careless abandon. Our Catholic identity gives us special responsibility to support the church's missionary endeavors, carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. This third mark compels us to avoid what Francis has termed the globalization of indifference, apathy toward those who suffer and struggle so often without voice or visibility, many living right here in our city limits. In this diocese, Greg, we can never grow weary of giving voice to the most vulnerable and voiceless in our midst. And therefore, we will speak up and speak out on behalf of the unborn, refusing to remain silent as the wholesale slaughter of the innocents continues unabated as a shameful scourge on the moral conscience of the nation. We cannot and will not be silent until unborn life is protected by the rule of law. We will not forsake the undocumented immigrants living and laboring in our community, members of our families and beloved parishioners. They so long for legal pathways to citizenship being forced to live in the shadows. Their daily bread is fear, 
And so I want you to join me in saying to each of them, we are there with you and there for you as treasured members of our Catholic community, and we will always plead your cause. Siempre estaremos aquí para ustedes. Siempre, siempre. We cannot forget the dreamers, young people whose hopes have been dashed by partisan inertia, making their hopes for a secure future a distant and elusive dream. To them I say, we are here for you as your friend and advocate, whether in the halls of government or in the corridors of power, and we will stay with you until your dreams come true. Iglesia es su amiga, nunca te olvidaremos, nunca, nunca, nunca. <clears throat> Greg, under the banner of Catholic, we can never fail to be moved by the images of homeless, desperate women and men living under our bridges and in city encampments, so often relegated there by undiagnosed mental illness and untreated addiction. How proud I am of the efforts of Catholic Charities, of the State Catholic Conference, and the charitable outreach of so many of our parish communities. You are active, vocal advocates on behalf of the poorest of the poor, right here in our communities, and you're helping to lighten the burdens of our people, sharing in their joys and hopes, their griefs and anxieties. You are showing others how to live the third mark of the church, her Catholic identity and mission. The final mark, Greg, apostolicity. You are soon to be ordained as the nation's newest bishop assigned by Pope Francis to serve as auxiliary bishop in this church. Preeminent among your duties will be the ministry of preaching and proclamation, a mandate we have received from the Lord himself. Take consolation that this is a ministry you do not shoulder alone. How often the Holy Father has reminded priests and bishops of their obligation to commission the lay faithful, as missionary disciples and heralds of the word. In the words of Pope Francis, the new evangelization calls for the personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. No exceptions, no exemptions, no abstentions. The mission discipleship of our people is a sleeping giant, awaiting to be awakened and mobilized. It is the key that unlocks the doors to the new evangelization. It is what makes the new evangelization new. Greg, you're being ordained as a successor of the apostles, an office entirely gratuitous and unmerited, except by the will of the one who has chosen you by name. The title you bear is not a title of honor, but one of service, fashioned after the one who came not to be served, but to serve. I make this request of you. Let your ministry be marked by humility and self-abnegation, allowing others to see in you the example of the heart of Jesus, a bishop who actively circulates in and among the people, never losing the common touch and of course, always having special solicitude toward the poor and underserved. In just a few moments, you will lie before this altar and resolve to serve the church in a new way through the power of the Spirit and the laying on of hands. From this day, every Sunday and solemnity into the future, I make this humble request. 
as you pray the words of the Nicene Creed. I hope that you'll remember and renew and relive and reclaim this blessed moment in your life and in the life of the diocese. God's speed, God's blessings, and God's love from all of us to you. I want to close my words with words drawn from the ordination rite itself, words that reflect powerfully the presence of the Holy Trinity captured in the Creed of Nicaea. Accept this ministry, my brother. In the name of the Father, whose image you represent in the church, in the name of the Son, Jesus, whose office of teacher, priest, and shepherd you will discharge, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the church of Christ, and by his power strengthens you in your weakness. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, in whose presence we have gathered, and who is here in our midst as one who serves. Amen and congratulations. The ancient rule of the Holy Fathers ordains that a bishop-elect is to be questioned in the presence of the people and is resolved to uphold the faith and to discharge his duty. And so, dear Greg, I ask you, do you resolve by the grace of the Holy Spirit to discharge unto death the office entrusted to us by the apostles, which we are about to pass on to you by the laying on of our hands? I do. Do you resolve to preach the gospel of Christ with constancy and fidelity? I do. Do you resolve to guard the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt, as handed down by the apostles and preserved in the church everywhere and at all times? I do. Do you resolve to build up the body of Christ, his church, and to remain in the unity of that body together with the order of bishops under the authority of the successor of Peter the Apostle. I do. To resolve to render obedient faith, obedience faithfully to the successor of blessed Apostle Peter. I do. To resolve to guide the holy people of God in the way of salvation as a devoted father and sustain them with the help of your fellow ministers, the priests and deacons. I do. To resolve for the sake of the Lord's name to be welcoming and merciful to the poor, to strangers, and to all who are in need. I do. To resolve as a good shepherd, to seek out the sheep who stray and gather them into the Lord's fold. I do. To resolve to pray without ceasing to Almighty God for the holy people and to carry out the office of high priest without reproach. I do with the help of God. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Dearly beloved, let us pray that the kindness of Almighty God in providing for the welfare of the church will grant an abundance of his grace for this, his chosen one. Let us kneel.
graciously hear our petitions, O Lord, and pour out upon this your servant the power of your blessing flowing from the horn of priestly grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand.
gospel for coming. God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, you dwell on high and look upon the lowly who know all things before they come to be and lay down observances in your church through the word of your grace, who from the beginning foreordained a nation of the just, born of Abraham, who established rulers and priests, did not leave your sanctuary without ministers, and who from the foundation of the world we're pleased to be glorified in those you have chosen. Pour out now upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the spirit of governance, whom you gave to your beloved son, Jesus Christ, the spirit whom he bestowed upon the holy apostles who established the church in each place as your sanctuary for the glory and unceasing praise of your name. Grant, O Father, knower of all hearts, that this your servant we have chosen for the office of bishop, may shepherd your holy flock, serving you night and day. May he fulfill before you without reproach the ministry of the high priesthood, so that always gaining your favor, he may offer up the gifts of your holy church. Grant that by the power of the spirit of the high priesthood, he may have the power to forgive sins according to your command, assign offices according to your decree, and loose every bond according to the power given by you to the apostles. May he please you by his meekness and purity of heart, presenting a fragrant offering to you through your son, Jesus Christ, through whom glory and power and honor are yours with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Am I seated? May God, who made you a sharer of the high priesthood of Christ, himself pour out upon you the oil of mystical anointing and make you fruitful with an abundance of spiritual blessings. Receive the gospel and preach the word of God with all patience and sound teaching.
receive this ring, the seal of fidelity, adorned with undefiled faith, preserve unblemished the bride of God, the Holy Church. Receive the mitre, and may the splendor of holiness shine forth in you, so that when the chief shepherd appears, you may deserve to receive from him an unfading crown of glory. Receive the crozier, the sign of your pastoral office, and keep watch over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as bishop to govern the church of God. together the ancient creed of Nicaea. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the God, the Son of God, born of the Father and all ages. God from God, light from light, God from God, God not made, consubstantial of the Father.
At this time, Bishop Gordon's 30 nieces and nephews will present the gifts of bread and wine, the oblations for the Eucharistic sacrifice. After the offertory procession, the Gordon children will then present roses to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, whose feast is today. Oh, no. 
pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice. May this oblation, O Lord, which we have presented for your church and for Gregory, your servant and bishop, become an offering acceptable to you and for the good of the flock. May he whom you have raised up among your people to be high priest be endowed by your gift with apostolic virtues through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son High Priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, with a brother's kindness, he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word, and strengthen them with the sacraments as they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love and so Lord with all the angels and saints we too give you thanks as in exultation we acclaim Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, mere unworthy servant. Gregory, our assistant bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, O Lord, your servants, and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion has known, are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves, and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls in the hope of health and well-being 
and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with us, whom, whom memory we venerate, especially the glorious Savior Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosman, and Damian, and all your saints, we ask that through the merits and prayers, in all things we may, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you, and also for your servant Gregory, whom we have been pleased to raise to the order of bishops, and in your mercy keep safe your gifts in him, so that what he has received by divine commission, he may fulfill by divine assistance through Christ our Lord. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance to accept them, as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angels to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, and be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants, who come before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, 
Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with each one of you. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace be with you. Peace. 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 Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy. She is under my roof.
Let us pray. By the power of this sacrament, O oh Lord, increase the gifts of your grace in Gregory, your servant and bishop, that he may serve you worthily in the pastoral ministry and receive the eternal rewards of a faithful steward through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'd please be seated, I would like to welcome Archbishop Cordeleone to the emblem. Don't worry, it's only one page. <laughs> I'll be brief since the decision was to save the best for last. <laughs> when I hear news of a priest being anointed a bishop, my habit is to greet him with the words, congratulations and condolences. <laughs> there is cause for both, but today we dwell on the congratulations to you, Bishop Gordon, and to your dear mother and your family. Yes, you did a very good job, Mrs. Gordon, and your, your late husband. Thank you. If it's not too uppity, I would like to congratulate our own province of San Francisco. Uh, Bishop Gordon's ordination is a great contribution to our whole province especially given the long historical connection between the Archdiocese and, and the Diocese of Las Vegas, including giving some of your bishops, uh, most notably the very first bishop of Las Vegas, Bishop Walsh, so appropriate that you're with us today. We're very happy you can be here. And also Bishop McFarlane before him. But most of all, obviously, the congratulations goes to the Diocese of Las Vegas and Bishop Thomas, what can I say other than then, I've never seen such a wide smile on your face as I have today. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Las Vegas is a young church in the sense of it has a relatively brief history, but it's also young in population. What most people think of when they think of Las Vegas, what's out there, is, is not what those of us who are familiar with church life think of. Those of us who know the realities of the church in our country and familiar with it, when we think of Las Vegas, we think of a vibrant, dynamic, and growing church. Catholic life thrives here, and the, there is potential of even, more, of even more and even greater that can be accomplished for our Lord. And so we are so grateful to our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who has acknowledged that the time has come for Las Vegas to be given an auxiliary bishop. And obviously the process is led and conducted by the Apostolic Nuncio. So especially thanks to you, Archbishop Pierre, for this wonderful gift to Las Vegas and the province of San Francisco. Bishop Gordon, I said con congratulations and condolences. You may be thinking that you don't deserve this. That's true in both senses of the term. <laughs> it is a harsh reality uh, to be chosen for the office of bishop. It is a much greater burden. There are much greater demands. A bishop's life is no longer his own. But it is also an opportunity to serve the church with greater sacrifice a greater opportunity to attain, with the help of God's grace, that heroic virtue that is holiness. This is all the more so in the times in which we are living. Society seems to be moving from one crisis to another or multiple crises at the same time. The church is left not unaffected. The answer to this time of crisis is the same as in any era of crisis. The answer is as profound as it is timeless. It is precisely heeding that call to holiness. For the bishop, this means his life must be rooted in prayer so that he may pour out his life in service to the people and trust to do his pastoral care with the sacrificial love of the father for his family. Bishop Gordon, we are all very happy with you this day in your church. 
The Holy Father has chosen well, and we promise you our prayers and our support. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to completion. Introducing for the very first time to all of you our new Auxiliary Bishop, Bishop Greg Gordon, who will now impart upon our whole assembly his first apostolic blessing. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you, O Lord. That's what our choir was, was chanting. And thank you for allowing me to impart my first blessing to you. Last year, 2020, was the Diocese of Las Vegas 25th anniversary. We're a young church, the second youngest Latin Rite Diocese in the United States. Only Laredo in Texas has us beat. Erected in 1995, and we were planning, and we were hoping that we could celebrate a jubilee. With a mass in which Bishop Thomas could be joined with Bishop Pepe and Bishop Walsh all three bishops of Las Vegas united with this particular church in prayer. Well, the pandemic prevented that from being realized. But, wait six months and look around you. Bishop Thomas with Bishop Pepe and Bishop Walsh as consecrator and co-consecrators and our nuncio, and our metropolitan archbishop, and our bishop's conference president, and a dozen brother bishops, and a cardinal. Isn't God amazing? <laughs> the Lord has his own way of showing his mercy and love, celebrating jubilee, giving to Las Vegas in her 25th and a half year, an auxiliary bishop from among her clergy, this presbyterate. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We acclaim you, Lord. <laughs> Excellency, Nuncio Pierre, please convey to Pope Francis whom we remember at this Mass, as he recovers from his surgery, our prayers, our affection, and our love. When you called me seven weeks ago, and since, as you said, I worked as a local collaborator with your predecessors in the Nunciature, I kind of sensed in your call that something was up. I was driving my niece Veronica, to my niece Veronica's first Holy Communion. She's the youngest of my 13 nieces and nephews who presented the offerings at today's Mass. 
and you asked if I could talk, and I said, sure. I'm driving to my niece's Holy Communion, and you said to me, stop the car, pull off the road. <laughs> I believe you didn't want to be the remote cause of a multi-car pile-up due to my reaction at the hearing of the news of Pope Francis's nomination. Thank you for your care for me. Thank you for your care for those driving around me. No crashes to be reported. Most of all, thank you for being here today. The personal representative of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, to the United States in Las Vegas. Thank you, Bishop Thomas, for ordaining me and for welcoming me to serve as your first auxiliary bishop, the first auxiliary bishop in Las Vegas and the state of Nevada. We're moving up. Thank you for your beautiful homily. I continue to learn much from you, and I look forward to assisting you and being your collaborator in the Episcopal ministry, teaching, sanctifying, governing, and leading this little flock of 250,000 Catholics, pequeño rebaño, in holiness and to the Lord. And thank you, my family. I have the most supportive family an auxiliary bishop could ever have. Here today, my mother Carol, my brothers and sister David, Karen, Paul, and Rick, and their families, all my nieces and nephews, aunts, uncles, cousin, my godfather, Uncle Bob Panacio, my late father, Dr. William Gordon, my grandparents, my great-grandmother have gone home to the Lord, but I know they are with me in prayer. The family is the school of faith. The family is the school of love. I, my brothers, and I have been blessed to have been raised in a strong, loving, faith-filled family. What a great blessing that is. Thank you. And, and to my extended family, which I think includes just about everybody here in the shrine, <laughs> all the priests and deacons of the Diocese of Las Vegas, and even when we were the Diocese of Reno in Las Vegas, were a blessed presbyterate, small, but mighty. I thank you for your fraternal support with me these past 33 years. I thank you for putting up with me these th past 33 years. My classmates from St. Charles Overbrook and North American College, Rome, your presence here brings back all our hopes and dreams since the seminar. And all the people from our parishes and apostolates where I've served in the diocese, in particular, where I've been pastor. St. Christopher's, North Las Vegas. St. Francis of Assisi, Henderson. St. Anne's, Las Vegas. <laughs> Serving the Lord together, we truly became a family, families of faith. And here we have with us other apostolates, the Knights and Ladies of St. Peter Claver, Knights of Columbus, Catholic Daughters, Knights and Dames of the Holy Sepulcher, and the, the Catholic Medical Association, St. Thomas More Society, representing various apostles of the diocese, and I believe laity from all 34 parishes and missions in the diocese scattered over 39,000 square miles. Thank you for coming from near and far to be with me on this day. Quiero ofrecer un, un, un gracias especial a la comunidad hispana aquí presente. Ustedes han sido una bendición para mí, sirviendo con ustedes en varias de mis parroquias por una gran parte de mi sacerdote. Ustedes y su renovación de la vida eclesial y familiar, la iglesia doméstica en nuestro diócesis, ha sido una verdadera formación para mí. Traerme a este momento de ordenación como obispo. Espero, quiero, 
continuar trabajando con ustedes en mi ministerio episcopal. Aunque no de sangre, soy hispano de corazón. And our consecrated religious sisters and brothers. One family of which I became a part was the Carmelite family, the Carmel of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph when they were in Las Vegas. I was their chaplain. This is a true story. They would remember me on my ordination day, January 16th. And I said to Mother Teresa and the other sisters one day, you know, I have no saint's feast day on my anniversary. And mother said to me, so that's okay. You can celebrate your half year anniversary with us on, on July 16th, on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel with Novena and all the solemnity that you can imagine throughout nine days. So when the nuncio called me on that day and said to me, your ordination day as auxiliary bishop will be July 16th, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, I smiled you couldn't, Excellency, see my smile over the phone because we weren't using FaceTime or doing anything like that. But I took that date you gave me today as a sign of the prayers of that family, the parish families, the religious families, and the Blessed Virgin Mary that have surrounded me in my priesthood with powerful intercessory prayer. I thank you also, members of the ecumenical, interfaith, civic communities from state, city, county, law enforcement, all accompanying me as well. There's something else about this Mass here today. Four years ago, this place, the lot right across the street from this shrine, became a killing field. Innocent human life was taken the largest mass killing in our nation's history. And now we are here praying, praying for peace and praying for life. We transform this place through the healing presence and power of Christ in the Eucharist. Dios está aquí, we just prayed. God is here. May my Episcopal ministry be one of healing. Dominic Verbo et Sana is my motto. We say that phrase every day in the liturgy. From the centurion to our, before our Lord, to the faithful in communion, Lord, say the word and heal. So I stand before you today asking for your prayers for me that I may be given the grace and the fortitude to consistently be a healer in Christ, defending the rights of the defenseless, the poor, weak, immigrant, unborn, with our Catholic faith and her blessed social doctrine. I hope to be very active and present throughout our diocese, from Sacred Heart in Ely, 250 miles to the north, to St. John the Baptist in Laughlin, 100 miles to the south, and everywhere in between, I hope to share the Lord's love with all as, as much as Padre Francisco Garces did, our missionary and martyr here in this place 245 years ago. Beyond this diocese, I be assured I will be a close collaborator with my brother bishops in the ecclesial life of our province, San Francisco, our region, Region 11, and our National Episcopal Conference. My dear brothers and sisters, wasn't this a beautiful Mass? Thanks to all. Th thanks to all who assisted in, in making it so. Father Bob Stokig and our ordination planning committee, our shrine and our cathedral staffs, our Catholic Center staff working into the wee hours to make this day so memorable, our MCs, deacons, chaplains, seminarian servers, lectors, gift bearers, our 
festival chorus of the Diocese of Las Vegas and the music ministers on the direction of William Freeman. I went to a few of their rehearsals in the diocese this past month, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Anthony of Padua, and, and here, and even their rehearsing praised God and lifted me up. Thank you all. Peace to you in Christ. Uh, let us praise God. Let us acclaim him, Lord. Dear Gregory, may the Lord bless you and keep you as he has willed to set you as high priest over his people. So may he make you happy in this present life and grant you a share in the happiness that is eternal. Amen. May he grant the clergy and people he has chosen to unite by his gracious help be happily governed by his providence and your stewardship for many, many years to come. Amen. May they obey God's commandments, freed from adversity. And may they abound in all that is good, submitting in faith to your ministry, so that they may enjoy peace and tranquility in the present age, and with you be found worthy to share the company of the citizens of eternity. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
reinará. 